Welcome back. My name's Cherry. I'm making a point to introduce myself because I have begun to notice that I never actually say my name or introduce myself. I thought I would do an introductory five fun facts about me and give you the opportunity to do a Q&A. I was recently included in Annie Laney's 20 disabled YouTubers playlist and video. Sorry, that's hard to say. <laughs> I was really, really flattered and happy to be included in that list. I'm really new to YouTube, so it feels like a big deal to me. And also, I loved what you had to say, Annie. Thank you. I was blushing so hard the whole time. I was lying in bed watching it last night and I was just blushing so hard. <laughs> I didn't know what to do. So thank you. So five fun facts. I don't know if they're fun, but I thought I would narrow it down to five because I'll be telling everyone everything from like my childhood to now, which would be a really long video. So let's try and keep this to five. I may go off on tangents because that's what I do. First of all, I'm gonna say that this is an opportunity to ask me any questions you would like. Ask below in the comments or ask me on Twitter if you follow me on Twitter. I can't wait to get your questions and answer them. I was really nervous actually asking this because I was paranoid that I would be saying, hey, ask me some questions and I'll basically get no questions. So at least one of you asked me a question, please. <laughs> okay. First of all, let's get this out of the way. It's not part of my fun facts, but yes, I am disabled. I use a wheelchair about, I'm gonna say 90 to 95% of the time when I'm outside of my house, occasionally inside my house on particularly difficult days. The rest of the time when I'm at home, I either kind of shuffle around, barely picking my feet up and grabbing onto surfaces for stability and I use a cane the rest of the time. Hopefully soon I'm gonna try out some crutches and see if that gives me a little bit more mobility in terms of inaccessible places. So we'll see how that goes. I also have a feeding tube. I don't really wanna get into my lengthy list of disabilities because they're very complex and it could go on forever. But if you are interested in a video specifically about my personal disabilities and what is behind that, then let me know and I will happily make that video. I'm very much about being as open and honest as possible. This is all about sharing my life with you on my other social media platforms like Instagram and Twitter, I've been very open. So I'd be happy to make that kind of video. If you're interested, let me know in the comments below. And if you have any questions about my disabilities or anything like that, feel free to ask those questions, but you can ask questions about anything. I don't mind. And maybe I'll be able to answer them, but if they're about life, the universe and everything, I may not have the answer, so be prepared for that. Okay, five fun facts. I hope they're fun. I don't think I really know the meaning of fun, so they may not be fun, but they're five facts about me. Number one, like many British people, oh, I'm just gonna actually back up a second here. Originally, I wanted to make this video in the car. That sounds a bit weird, but I was recently on a very exciting road trip and kind of adventure in the mountains, which you will be seeing those videos really soon, I hope. It's gonna take me quite a while to edit them all. Fingers crossed they start trickling out into your feed soon. So I was originally gonna make it on the last leg of the road trip, except the light was really weird and really bright sun that kind of kept coming and going, so it wouldn't have made for a good video. So now I'm doing it at home. It's two days later. <laughs> that leads into the first fact. I can't drive. I've never learned to drive. I've never, or I have sat in the driver's seat, but I've never sat in the driver's seat while it's on any kind of car. <laughs> like a number of British people I know, I never learned to drive because it is astronomically expensive. Now I'm too disabled to drive. It would be kind of dangerous for me to drive. I will probably never ever drive. Maybe I'll drive a go-kart one day. It's kind of on my list of things to do, so we'll see. <laughs> Number two, I am officially a sweet collector. Now, I think some people would say I'm a sweet hoarder. Let's stick to the more flattering collector. I have a weird compulsion and obsession with buying sweets and I've had it ever since I was a teenager. I have no idea if it's related to something in my childhood. When I say sweets, I mean the British sweets, which is candy, not like desserts, although, do like those two, don't have quite the same compulsion. Basically what it amounts to is that I'll see sweets in the shop and I'll be like, oh, I like those sweets or chocolate bar, anything like that and I'll buy them. 
whether I'm gonna eat them or not. Usually I actually do plan to eventually eat them, but they kind of amount a mass. And right now I can't eat very much and I haven't been able to for a couple of years. So they have accumulated in boxes in more than one cupboard in my kitchen. So I'm a sweet collector. I have a collection. I try to get through it all so it's not so wasteful, but sometimes they go bad and they do not fulfill their destiny. Number three, I love science fiction everything. It has been one of my obsessions since I was a teenager. I love everything when it comes to science fiction. Let's make that clear. Comic books, movies, TV, science fiction literature, everything. Let's start with the thing I'm most picky about, which is science fiction literature. I'm gonna say I'm kind of a snob. Picky is probably more flattering, but snob is probably more accurate. <laughs> I I have always found it very difficult to read. I have found it even more difficult to read since a stroke that I had in 2013. I've only actually read a couple of books since then. And so because I found it such a, a challenging thing for me, I've always been really picky about which books I read. I'm gonna say I love a lot of different types of science fiction, but they all have similar themes. So I really love cyberpunk and hard-boiled cyberpunk mysteries, that kind of thing. I really love space opera, so really broad, spacey, big worlds, big universes, spaceships, but also with an intellectual theme and dystopian science fiction and kind of anything that I'm gonna say questions humanity, our place in the universe, looks hard at society, anything that is analytical in that way and also is a little bit intellectual. So that's why I say snob. I have a bit of a, a stash right here. I'm just gonna see if I can reach it. Hang on a sec. I didn't plan this out. They're all really heavy too, and I have a hard time picking up heavy things. This is not necessarily my absolute favorite books, but these are some of my favorite authors. Let's start with the top. Tars Dross. This is number two in a series. Whoops, that's the back. Read that a long time ago. This is one of the most heartbreaking books I've ever read. The Road. Here we go. Love this book. I made a bunch of my friends go and watch the film at the cinema on my birthday, which if you've seen the film, it is an extremely dark film. I cried so much that I had pools of tears in my collarbones pooled in here. We came out of the theater and one of my friends just goes, well, thanks for the cheery birthday. So that's a fun story. China Mieville. Now he kind of straddles science fiction and fantasy. While I used to love fantasy when I was a teenager, I became so obsessed with science fiction, especially futuristic and near future science fiction. I never went back to fantasy. Don't unfollow me or unsubscribe, but I don't like Game of Thrones. I did listen to all the audiobooks and I did quite enjoy the story, but that's the only dabble in fantasy I've had in my adult life. I think he straddles the fantasy science fiction worlds really exceptionally well. Philip K. Dick, absolutely one of my all time, absolute all time favorite authors. Philip K. Dick was one of the authors that really made me fall in love with science fiction. I haven't read all his books yet and I dread the day that I've read all of his books. So, John Courtney Grimwood writes some fantastic near future cyberpunk, especially this one. Ian M. Banks' Matter. I actually love many of his books, but this one especially was a big deal to me. I don't know what it was. It just really spoke to me. I think it was the main character whose name begins with a D. I think it, yeah, Dian. Dian? I hope that's how you say it. So much so that in all the video games I played for about two years after I read this book, that was the name of any character that I could give a name to <laughs> was her name. She becomes an assassin and it's just, oh. Now Alistair Reynolds, this isn't my favorite book of his, but it is an excellent one. And the thing I love about Alistair Reynolds, the giant worlds and universes he creates and also that he manages to work hard science in there and it's not mind numbingly boring. It is fascinating and exciting and thrilling. There's another one. What really got me into science fiction literature was the classics, obviously. Well, not obviously, because that's not how it happens for everyone, but that's how it happened for me when I was 
a teenager. I think it was probably Arthur C. Clarke and Isaac Asimov first. That kind of gives you an idea maybe of the type of science fiction literature that I like. Then when it comes to comic books, I'm slightly less picky about the story, but I'm extremely picky about the art. Art is always subjective, but there is something about comics to me that if I don't find the art appealing, it's just not accessible to me. It doesn't matter how good the story is, if I don't enjoy looking at the art, then I just can't read it. Even if the story is kind of trashy, but the art is amazing, I will love it. So it's slightly different to how I feel about science fiction literature. I've got another little pile here. These are just ones that I grabbed off my shelf. Ooh, I pulled a muscle there. Ooh, a cramp. The pectoral cramps are the worst. Maybe not, the neck cramps are the worst. This one's pretty bad, okay. The oldest one on there is probably Why the Last Man. I think last year I read that series. There are definitely some problematic things in the story. I think Brian K. Vaughan, I'm just gonna say this, has a problem with the R word and I really wish he wouldn't use it so much. The art is so beautiful and it's a post-apocalyptic story, which for me is the best. I loved it despite its problems. I feel like that about most comics that I read. Not all comics, they always have a flaw that kind of is hard for me to ignore, but what you can do. Another one written by Brian K. Vaughan, but drawn by my friend Fiona Staples is Saga. I love it, especially for the art. The art is incredible. I mean, every page, so good. Again, Brian K. Vaughan uses the R word too much, but other than that, the story is great and the world that they've built together is phenomenal. East of West is another really science fiction-y, but again, a little bit fantasy. Great series. This is a really different kind of art. That is Jeff Lemire who is a Canadian artist and writer. His art style is very scratchy and raw, and I love that. It's so different and unique, but it's really emotive at the same time. And his Sweet Tooth series, oh, it really gets you right in here. Again, post-apocalyptic, really dark, a bit scary. Again, Jeff Lemire wrote this one as Descender. I mentioned it in one of my other videos, The Breakfast Snack Accidents. And it's beautiful and exciting. It's robots, which aside from post-apocalyptic science fiction, robot science fiction will get me every time. So that brings me on to TV and movies. I love all kinds of TV and movie science fiction, but I'm totally not picky at all, especially when it comes to TV. I will watch the trashiest, trashy science fiction. Obviously I love the really good, well-made, well-written science fiction, but I will watch the trashy sci-fi channel science fiction that doesn't do very well with audiences. <laughs> I just love getting lost in those science fiction worlds. And I love the post-apocalyptic thing. Other than that, I just really like anything science fiction, especially near future science fiction TV and movies. Movies I'm more picky about than TV for sure. I'll watch pretty much any science fiction. If it's science fiction, I'm probably gonna watch it, even if I hate it. I'll watch it all the way through. <laughs> Number four, I love nature. I am the kind of person that loves the city and will probably always live in the city. There's something about the city that really is just for me, probably to do with the slightly futuristic aspect of the fact that everyone is kind of pulling into the cities and experiencing that section of humanity's journey and being a part of that. I grew up near the countryside, well, pretty much in the countryside in a little village, which is a whole other story. And so at least half of me is drawn to nature and obsessed with nature. So I feel like there's two halves of me and they kind of pull against each other. One's the city half and one's the nature half. And let's start with the thing I'm most obsessed about, which is birds. <laughs> I still remember when I first fell in love with birds and became obsessed with them. I was a little kid, our house was on the edge of, a, of farmland and so in our garden we had all sorts of birds and mammals and creatures. We had bats living in our wall. <laughs> I saw a woodpecker, which was a very British woodpecker. I actually don't know the name of it. I'm gonna get onto that in a minute about my memory problems. But in North America, most woodpeckers are black and red. In Europe, there is a type of woodpecker that is a bright bottle green 
and red. That is the woodpecker that I saw when I was a kid and it was the first time that I thought to myself, I'm gonna learn about them. And I first realized that there were different species and that there was something to learn there and that there were facts to know. And I was so excited about that. So that was when I first became obsessed with birds. Now I've always had memory problems when it comes to remembering the names of things. I think in pictures and I'm a very visual person, I can recall what something looks like like that. If someone was to tell me the name of something, I could know what it looked like instantly. Being able to remember specific facts is also very difficult, even though I love to try and do it. And so I've learned a good number of birds, but I don't always remember their names, even though I can identify them essentially. Which is very frustrating to me, but I still try. I also love mosses and lichen. Love them so much. I don't know what it is about them. I think it's especially lichen, it's because they're in tiny little universes in themselves, which is just incredible. Mosses, they just, they're so nice looking. I like the colors, there's so many different colors and textures, the textures definitely. I really wanted to learn the different species of mosses and lichen. First of all, I found out that lichen are extremely difficult to identify, especially the individual species because they can be very similar and the only real way to identify them is under a microscope. I knew that was out. I decided I do not need to identify losses, mosses and my, ugh. Losses of mycon, <laughs> I love collecting them and drying them. Yeah, about as much as I know is this is a rock lichen, this is a tree lichen, this is a ground lichen. I don't think those are real facts, but there you go. Okay, I need a drink. Wow, I think this has been a bit more serious than I intended. <laughs> Number five, the last fun-ish fact important fact about me is that I was a professional photographer for 12 years. I was also a professional artist for four years, although I do hope to get back to that one. It really played a big part in making me who I am today. It was a huge career. It was very challenging at times. Oh, that's my cat. Hello. Hello. It taught me a lot about myself and the world. Before I was a photographer, I worked in offices. Then before that, I was a waitress and I was never able to do those kind of normal jobs for various reasons to do with my impairments. I don't wanna go into that now because this is supposed to be fun fact. So if you have any questions about that, I'll be happy to answer them. But basically it allowed me to have a job. I got paid for it almost a living wage, but I did get paid for it. The thing about doing photography as a job for me was it allowed me to be semi-successful at what I did. And it also allowed me to explore a big part of me and that's how I see the world. While what I did was not necessarily my true passion because it was for clients, it was basically what they wanted. It did allow me to express how I see light and color, which is a really big part of who I am. I do need to make clear that photography as a profession is not very much photography. It was mostly replying to emails, a lot of editing, a lot of editing. I think a lot of people that don't use cameras don't realize that photos don't necessarily come out of the camera how you want to see them or how you want to express them. And it was true even for film photography. It was in 2013 after I'd been also pursuing visual art on the side for four years at that point, where I was part of a few gallery shows. I really got some momentum going with that. And after my relationship with my major clients broke down and things got so stressful, that they were impacting what I wanted to do with my art and my life in general. It, it was really a difficult thing. I decided that I had to quit photography. It was also at the point where my disabilities were getting severe enough that it was hard to do such a physical job, which photography is an extremely physical job. And I decided I couldn't do it anymore, which was a very difficult thing for me because after 12 years, it was the only thing I'd ever done for that long. I'm a very constantly transitional person. So doing something for that long was a really big deal. And it was very hard for me. I quit. It's still really hard to talk about. Three weeks later, after I decided that, okay, I'm going to not do photography anymore and I'm going to really pursue with earnest my visual art career, I had a stroke. I've had a lot of difficulties since then and my disabilities have progressed. But again, I didn't want to make this video about that. I did want to finish on my last fact. The biggest part of my life was that I was a professional photographer. So, those are my five fun-ish facts. <laughs> Again, I probably misunderstand what fun means. I could probably th have thought of more silly facts maybe is more fun, I don't know. Anyway, hopefully you learned something. Hopefully you've watched this entire thing which got really long. Once I get talking, it's hard to stop me. 
It's also hard to get me to start, but once I get going, there's a lot of tangents. I hope you enjoyed these five funnished facts. If you have any questions, which is the point of this video, leave them down below or on Twitter, and I will do my best to answer them in a week or so, and stick around for my adventure videos. Those are coming up really soon, hopefully. So thanks for watching, and leave a thumbs up if you enjoyed these five fun facts. Maybe one day I'll do a hundred facts, and you can sit here for an hour and watch. <laughs> I, that sounds like a threat, I'm sorry. I like you. Oh, I did want to say that I want this to be an opportunity to get to know each other. Now I have quite a few new subscribers that don't come from my social media and so don't necessarily know me and I don't know you. If you are comfortable with this and you feel like this is something you want to do, leave a comment below with five of your own fun facts and then we can get to know each other. And also questions, obviously, because that would be really embarrassing if there are no questions. Okay, thanks for watching. Leave a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe. Bye! And I used to hate zombies, and I used to say it was because zombies were boring, but if I'm really honest, it's because zombies terrify me. Not because I think zombies are gonna happen, because I understand intellectually they're very unlikely to happen. In fact, probably they can't happen, really. I mean, can really, it's fantasy to think that a dead body could come back to life. But at the same time, what if? I'm just terrified. So I've watched a lot of the zombie stuff. Obviously The Walking Dead, everyone watched that one. The first couple of seasons absolutely terrified me to the point where I couldn't sleep. It's less scary now, I think. But I really love like the trashy ones. What's it called? Oh, I really can't remember what it's called. Matthew? Yeah? Can you remember what that zombie show that's really kind of low budget that I really like? Citizen Z, is that what it's called? Z Nation, that's it, okay, thanks. Okay, I had to ask Matthew. <laughs> it's really trashy, low budget, but I love it. It's good if you like trashy TV.